Hi. So, one of the recent themes of this channel has been to run DOS games on unusual computers, but there's one implied question that we've never properly answered. What's the fastest possible computer you can build that can still natively run DOS games? Well, last year I went some way to answering this question by building my Retro Rocket PC, which is based around an AMD Athlon processor running at 2.1GHz, but I'm sure you'll agree that that's nowhere near fast enough for today's modern DOS gamer. Well, today we're going to be building a computer with what is, I believe, currently currently the fastest possible processor that can still game on DOS. Let's get started. Now, as I've said many times before on this channel, the main reason that DOS games won't run on modern PCs is because of audio output. Essentially all DOS games were written in a time when ISA sound cards were the industry standard, and ISA slots haven't typically been included on new PCs for over two decades. What we now call the ISA slot has its roots in the expansion slots of the original IBM PC. These slots basically just exposed the entire PC system bus, along with some extra signals for DMA and IRQ. The ISA slot was eventually replaced by the PCI slot, which works in very much the same way, but unfortunately the way DMA works on PCI is completely different from ISA. This means that PCI sound cards couldn't ever be 100% software compatible with ISA sound cards, as pretty much all DOS games were written with ISA DMA in mind. For this reason, ISA slots and sound cards were kept in production for years longer than they might otherwise have been, purely because it was the only way that DOS games could have fully functioning sound. Now, believe it or not, you can still buy motherboards with ISA slots on them. There's some very reasonably priced ones on AliExpress, with LGA755 sockets that can take Pentium 4, Core 2 Quad, and even Xeon processors. These are intended for the industrial embedded market, where they're used in older equipment that still needs ISA slots. However, these all have one fatal flaw, they don't support DMA. This might be fine for typical industrial applications, but makes them useless for DOS gaming. However, there is one LGA775 motherboard that this doesn't apply to, the legendary Ruby 9719 by Portwell. Unlike the AliExpress motherboards, its ISA bridge chip is fully compatible with DMA and therefore should support DOS games. And after looking for years, I eventually found one for a reasonable price and snapped it up right away. And here we have it, the uh, legendary Portwell Ruby. As you can see, this uh, motherboard has a rather bewildering array of connectors, as well as uh, obviously ISA like we talked about. It's got PCI Express. I mean, I've never seen a motherboard with both PCI Express and ISA on it at the same time. In addition to that, we have compact flash, four SATA ports, a mini IDE port, as well as on the front, two Ethernet jacks, uh, four USB plugs, which are actually USB 2, not USB 3, video output for the integrated graphics, parallel serial and PS2 and also uh, onboard integrated audio. It's like somebody threw a bunch of random connectors into a bag and shook it up. <laughs> you know, it's uh, quite a sight to behold. Quite an unassuming appearance as well, just plain green solder mask, which hides the fact that this is a truly special board. Talking of truly special boards, this video is brought to you by PCBWay, who have very kindly supplied circuit boards for all of my projects for nearly two years now. New users get $5 off their first order, which basically makes it free, you just pay shipping. You can also get assembly services for as little as $30 for up to 20 boards, which is ridiculously cheap, but uh, I've been using them since long before they even sponsored me, and their work has always been absolutely top-notch. They even managed to obtain some relatively difficult to obtain parts for me, so I can absolutely recommend their assembly services. They also now offer very reasonably priced low-volume CNC machining and 3D printing services, and lots of other stuff like injection moulding and sheet metal fabrication, so hit them up if any of that sounds useful to you. Anyway, with that insane motherboard, we'll need an insane processor. So I went with this 3.3GHz quad-core Xeon X5470. This is actually an LGA771 processor, but as LGA775 is practically identical, the processors are interchangeable with a little bit of modification. I actually bought my processor pre-modified, so I didn't even have to do anything. In terms of RAM, I'm going to stick a couple of these 2GB DDR2800 RAM modules. I believe it is possible to get 4GB modules, giving us a total of 8GB, but uh, they seem to be quite rare and expensive, so I'm just going to go with 4GB uh, for the moment. But that will be <laughs> more than enough for everything we want to do, I imagine. <laughs> now, I'd love to stick a really high-performance PCI Express graphics card in this just to make it even more ridiculous, but unfortunately, you can't stick a very big PCI Express graphics card in it because the lever for the RAM can have 
blocks the end of the PCI Express port off. And I do have a GTX 770, which is kind of an older card anyway, but I mean, it's still not going to fit in here. So just for the moment, I'm going to go with this uh, NVIDIA, what is it? Um, Quadro FX 1700, which is not a very fast card, but, but it will at least fit in the PCI Express socket without fouling the RAM. It's possible I might be able to get a faster graphics card in there by uh, using a PCI Express riser or maybe removing one of the levers here, but this will do for the moment. Now, obviously we're going to need some sort of boot device, a hard drive or whatever. When I'm building old PCs, I really like these SD card to IDE adapters. They work really, really well and are fast enough to run quite late period IDE PCs perfectly well. But this motherboard's so new, it has SATA connectors, so this thing won't really do it justice. So I think I'm going to go with a SATA SSD. Now, it's not a particularly good SSD, but it's certainly by a large margin the fastest boot device I've ever run Windows 98 from. So let's give it a go. The final piece of the puzzle is this extremely appropriate case that I found on Facebook Marketplace for next to nothing and somehow managed to transport home in my bicycle. Uh, this is a bad idea, especially while filming it. Turns out I actually knew the guy selling it, so shout out to Doug if he's watching. I'm not going to bother showing you footage of me building it because you all know what that looks like, so I'm going to skip right ahead to installing Windows 98. So because I've installed Windows 98 literally probably 50 times this year alone, I thought it was about time I made myself an unattended Windows 98 setup using an answer file. One cool thing I have noticed is that you can still run Microsoft Batch 98, that's the program that you need in order to make a Windows 98 unattended installation answer file. You can still run it on Windows 10, which is really cool, presumably Windows 11 too, so I don't even have to install Windows 98 one more time to make an answer file, that's great. Alright, let's see what we get. Oh, looks promising. Oh, there it goes on its merry way. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely going to save me some time. <laughs> also, I've never seen this file copy progress go so quickly, so I'm guessing that's because of the faster hard drive. Ah, now I've seen this problem before. What I believe this is caused by is there being too much memory installed, uh, ironically. Windows 98 doesn't do well with more than about 512 megabyte of RAM, so we have to use a little utility to fix that. Okay, excellent, no, that's good. Cool, it's already filled in all that for me. Product key's already filled in. All right, first boot. Ooh, we have a desktop. So I think before we lean into Windows too hard, let's try DOS, or, or more specifically Windows 98 in DOS mode. I suppose the standard thing to start with is DOS Bench. Check CPU, looks right. Yep, it is an Intel Xeon quad core. I wonder how fast Doom is going to run. Loaded already faster than... Bloody hell, look at it go. And we get 133 frames a second. It's only the fastest score I've seen so far, but... I do feel like it should be able to get faster somehow. Maybe it just can't write to the VGA registers fast enough. All right, quake. I'm also expecting this to be insanely quick. <laughs> 2.5 seconds to run the whole demo. 381.3 frames per second. I guess it just has more efficient VGA access than Doom. Quite a slightly higher resolution. All right, so 29.4, that's less than you might think. All right, so let's try, well, this is the native resolution of the panel. Ah, this is running quicker, that's interesting. Probably because it's using a Visa mode and therefore it doesn't access it in quite the same way as one of the standard VGA modes. Because 640 by 480 is a standard VGA resolution. And, oh, here we go, 59.2. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So increasing the resolution actually speeds it up. Let's try Talkbench. 352, that doesn't sound terribly high to me. A lot of these later processors don't run very fast in real mode, so that's maybe what's going on here. SpeedSys normally works on quite fast processors. Thinks it's a Pentium 3, 700 megahertz. That is not what it is. All right, so that's stuff benchmarked. Let's try putting a sound card in it and see what happens. This is the moment of truth for the ISA slot. I'm gonna use this cheapo generic sound card that has a crystal semiconductor CS4237 in it, which is a reasonably compatible sound blaster chip. It's the same one used in like the Orpheus sound card and whatnot. Okay, sound card's installed. Let's see if we can initialize it. Um, Unisound should just work. Oh, it found it, look at that. I suppose it's customary to try Doom at this point. Hmm, we have no audio at all. Yeah, this is a Sound Blaster diagnostics program written by Eric Schlaefer, aka Tube Time, who made a Sound Blaster clone called the Snark Barker. Um, and this is just a test program that can test it and other Sound Blaster compatible chips. So let's see, we're not getting anything. Adlib not detected. Not very happy. However, I did kind of expect this. The ISA port on the Ruby isn't by default set up to have all of the port address ranges forwarded and whatnot. However, there is a utility to help us with that called Ruby ISA. This is written by this person. I don't know how to pronounce their name, but it basically forwards uh, all of these addresses, some of which are needed for sound cards. I think I just run it. Okay, 
Right, let's reinitialize the sound card. Let's see if that changed anything. Oh, it detected it. Excellent. Oh, I think this is working. Excellent. Hey, we have ad lib anyway. Oops, wee bit loud. Oh, this looks, this looks like it's working. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, amazing. Oh, this runs so well. I have quite literally never seen DOS Doom running on a computer this fast before with full audio. There we go. We're working. Frame rate is extremely good for DOS Quake. All right, here we have DOS Quake running at 1280 by 1024, and it's absolutely butter smooth. I have never seen DOS Quake looking this good or running this well. Now, Shadow Warrior is a build engine game, and build engine games are notorious for requiring exponentially more power at higher resolutions. Like, uh, you'd think it would scale up linearly, but um, even the retro rocket I built a year ago struggles to run build engine games at high resolution. It says it goes up to 800 by 600, but we can actually go even further than that, if I remember correctly. All right, 1280 by 1024. On the Retro Rocket, this was really starting to chug at this point. The fact that it's still running at, what is it? Locked at 60 frames per second is <laughs> pretty good. Can we go up one more? Probably not on this monitor. Yeah, the signal's over range, so we can't see the edge of the screen, and we can't even adjust it. Yeah, it definitely feels a bit slower, so even this processor isn't uh, quite enough to run Shadow Warrior at uh, full 1600 by 1200 Visa mode. That is pretty funny. Ah, voxels, whatever happened to them? All right, um, this is Redneck Rampage, another build engine game that's supposed to be pretty processor intensive at the higher resolutions. Ooh, goes all the way up to 1600 by 1200. Yeehaw! <laughs> Lots of fun. I don't think I've played Redneck Rampage before, actually. It's a bit Star Wars-y. <laughs> Ooh, shotgun. That'll do. Am I supposed to be shooting this car? Oh dear, I got a hit. It is actually dropping below 60. It went down to about 29 frames a second there, so I shudder to think how this would run on a much lower PC than this. So yeah, it goes to show you, even this ridiculous PC can't cope with some build engine games. Grand Prix 2, another supposedly uh, very resource-intensive game. Uh, let's do a quick race. Should be set to maximum um, detail. I think Monaco is a particularly demanding track. <laughs> Yeah, that's some 90s uh, racing drivers. Yeah, this looks uh, really nice. Very nice. I don't know what frame rate it's going at, but uh, seems to be uh, doing really well. An amazing looking game for a DOS game, really, isn't it? All software rendering. Yeah, I think it, it didn't run very well on the machines that were around when it came out. It only really started to run well in this high resolution mode on computers that came out years after this game came out. <laughs> the European, wow. <laughs> dates this almost exactly. There's another uh, DOS game I'd like to try, um, and it's uh, Quake 2. Um, you see, a very clever human has ported Quake 2 to DOS, and it should work. Oh, sound and everything, great. Looks good. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this all seems to be looking really, really good, and it's playing at a pretty locked 60 frames a second, so that's really good. Oh, actually, the frame is dropping a bit now. I'm looking at water, going down to 30, 40-ish. Even this ridiculously fast PC has difficulty with software rendering in Quake 2. Yeah, this this is extremely playable. Anyway, I was never the world's biggest fan of Quake 2. I thought it was a bit kind of sterile and bland as a game. Unreal came out shortly afterwards, and Unreal just kind of took over my time instead, but... Uh... I'm installing Windows XP. May God have mercy on my soul. All right, that's uh, Windows XP installed, um, and everything seems to be working great. However, um, there is one problem that we perhaps might have expected and that the sound card doesn't work. So if I test the sound, we can hear absolutely nothing. Now, it's the same problem we had in DOS earlier in that the motherboard hasn't been set up to forward the appropriate ports to the ISA slot. Now, that's not a problem for Windows 98 because we can stick the Ruby ISA program in the autoexec.bat, but Windows XP isn't based on DOS, so we can't just run the Ruby ISA program before we start. And Ruby ISA has not been ported to Windows XP or anything like that. However, I do have a potential solution for this problem. If I first boot into Windows 98, then I can run the Ruby ISA program. Now that I've initialized the ISA slot properly, I can now do this. Now, Grub is a bootloader that if you use Linux, you'll probably be familiar with, but as DOS runs in real mode, it's possible to just start it from DOS rather than starting it from the BIOS. So all I have to do is chain loader plus one, boot, and Hey presto, I'm back in the boot menu without restarting the computer. If I'd restarted the PC, then the BIOS would have reinitialized the ISA port to be disabled. But because I'm entering this without rebooting, then hopefully the ISA port will still be working in XP. And there we have it. <laughs> hey presto. <laughs> yeah, everything's working fine. Quick game of pinball. Bollocks. 
All right, let's get Windows 10 on it now. Maybe play some modern games. I don't know if Windows 10 can upgrade Windows XP. Let's see. Hmm, nah, probably not. Fair enough. Ooh, Windows 10 logo. No, no, required. No, 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 not now. All right, Windows 10. And I can already see there's no audio output device installed, apparently. Maybe it just doesn't have drivers for it. Let's have a look at Device Manager. No, we're not even seeing any devices without drivers, so don't think it knows much about the ISA buff. All right, Steam's working. What, uh, yeah, laugh at the pathetic size of my library all you want, but uh, joke's on you, I have a girlfriend. Oh, okay, they don't have the original version of Crisis on here. Don't think Crisis Remastered works on 32-bit. No. Windows 10, 64-bit. Uh, oh, I think I bought the GOG version of it. All right, here we go. Oh, look at that. On low detail level, it's running basically 60 frames a second. That's really good. Wow, that looks almost playable. This is much better than last year's Retro Rocket, I gotta say. And that's with this not very good graphics card in it. If it were stick like a 10 series GeForce or something like that, I bet it'd be even better. Well, yeah, we're getting like above 40 frames a second fairly consistently. The Retro Rocket last year could barely get 15, 20 frames a second, so that's really good. I'm not particularly interested in running particularly modern games on this PC, but uh, if you've got any ideas of games that will run that might be interesting, let me know. Just to see how useful it is as a normal computer, like can I browse YouTube and so on? Oh, who's this handsome devil? Yeah, it's theoretically 1080p, but um, it's not dropping any frames or anything, so it seems to be able to decode 1080p YouTube, no problem. You know, if you tamper your expectations a little, this could maybe be used as a modern, <laughs> like, a desktop PC. Okay, so that's about all we've got time for today. I'd definitely like to do some more experiments with this crazy motherboard in the future, so if you have any ideas for stuff to try or games you want to see running, then comment below. One thing I definitely want to try is running a CGA or Hercules monochrome graphics card in it, but so far I haven't been able to get them to work, possibly because they aren't available at boot time for the BIOS to detect. By the way, as part of my experiments, I wrote my own version of Ruby ISA that can forward arbitrary ports, and I'll give you a link to the GitHub where it's published below. If you're looking for a much more complete build with this motherboard, then there's this Vogon's thread where user Frosty the Snowman built a really incredible system and has lots of tips on how to get different things working. It's an absolute work of art, and I'll link you to it below. I'd like to say thanks to Taido, the author of Ruby ISA, for kindly answering my questions about board initialization routines, as well as my mate Doug for providing the case, and everyone at Portwell for making such a magnificently weird motherboard. If you like this video, then like, subscribe, comment, etc, and I hope you have a great December. Bye-bye!